And good morning, everyone. We are here again on a glorious Sunday morning. We welcome everyone out, and uh, we rejoice in, yes. in God's goodness today. Welcome our folks by way of live stream as well. We're thankful to have uh, anybody out there joining us, and uh, we believe the Word of God will bless you today as we get into it. Amen. And as we worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your presence today once again to worship and praise you, Lord. We, we thank you that you are a good God and that we can, we can come into your very presence. Your word says, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart, and into his course with praise. We do, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. We ask that you would bless your people as we worship you today. And we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, all right. I'm going to give myself a little more guitar. Maybe too much. All right.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord. My voice is much stronger today, if I do say so myself. Amen. I was, I, I was uh, speaking the other day with uh, on the telephone with uh, Brother Woods and uh, a well-known TV evangelist that will go nameless. You would know the name if I mentioned it. But uh, this brother told me, he says, well, you've got a good voice. I don't know what you look like, but you got a good voice. And I said, well, I said, put it this way, brother. I've got a face for radio. But anyway, all right, praise the <laughs> Lord. Amen. Will great minds the Lord our God great minds.
Lord Jesus. Praise God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My, my, thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, my, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. My, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Maybe you see in the Lord's presence. If you're not already, praise God. Amen. Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And uh, that is in a tense in Greek that means be being filled. It's a continual thing. Huh? Amen. It's a continual thing. You know, there's one initial baptism in the Holy Spirit, but there are many refillings of the Spirit. Amen. So, we need to be being filled. Hallelujah. And if any of you know, we can be rather leaky <laughs> and need to be refilled. Huh? Amen. Amen. All right. Anyone want to lift up a word of testimony to the Lord this morning and give him praise this morning? Anyone in the house today? You got a testimony out there in, in uh, live stream, type, type it in the comments. But anybody here in the house have one you want to lift up the Lord? Go ahead. Oh, I praise the Lord. My sweet husband went in to the doctor, was it Friday? Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a pretty good clean bill of health. He's got to go a little further with it, but just praise the Lord. Amen. I like to have him around, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, they, uh, well, anyway, I, I won't go into all of it, but they, they uh, I got a, um, I got a B minus C plus, B minus C plus. <laughs> And he says, the doctor says, that's pretty good. You were half two weeks ago. So, so, <laughs> amen, amen. But uh, that's awesome. Anyway, anyone else with a word of testimony for the Lord? Anybody else? I praise the Lord that I'm back in church. I do too, Mary. Yes. Amen. I do too. Awesome. I missed everybody for the last two weeks. and Yeah, uh, we miss seeing you. So hopefully that won't happen again. There you go. We missed you. Amen. <laughs> So, awesome. Even glad to see Tara today. <laughs> uh, got a half just, leave, just leave it right there, sister. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, I had to ha harass her just a little bit. She oh. looked like she wasn't quite with it. So I'm with it. I'm just crawling out from underneath a rock, and I haven't made it yet. All right. right. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. We'll help you. I need me more than lifted up. I need the rock gone. All right, fair enough, sister. We'll, we'll believe that you. I'm not complaining. Way. I'm merely explaining. I, you're just explaining. I get it. I, I just explain it. I get it. All right. Doesn't mean ah. everything's okay, but I'm not quite sure how to fit anything together. My all right. puzzle's all together. All right, I got her started. But mm -hmm. my kids need prayer. Um, I know that's coming next. My daughter and my son-in-law definitely. Lift them up in prayer that God would just rearrange some things that they would have more to do together as a couple. All right. And that they would just be that one that the Lord has created them to be. Yes. Yes, indeed. Anyone else with a prayer request or testimony? All right. Well, let's pray today. Father, we thank you, Lord. That you are a good God. Your word says that we are to come under the throne of grace to find mercy and help. Throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Lord, we know there's a need here. 
Lord, for Tara's daughter and son-in-law, Lord, we just believe you to work in their marriage, Lord, that you would cause them to get a revelation of you and your goodness. And Lord, as they draw closer to you, cause them to draw closer to one another. Pray for my sister Tara today, this rock she says she's been experiencing. We, Lord, your word tells us to speak unto the mountain and say, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in our hearts. But believe that those things we say shall come to pass. We shall have whatever we say. And so we speak to that, to that rock, Lord, that she would not only get out from under it, but you would remove it. You would cause, we just come against any confusion, any thing that comes against her in the name of Jesus and believe that you would just give her a fresh touch of your blessed Holy Spirit. And we thank you for everything in her life coming into alignment with the Word of God. And we thank you for it. Lord, I thank you how you've been working in my body, Lord, and you continue that good work. And I thank you for the good report on Friday. And Lord, we thank you for that just to continue to move forward. And we give you praise and we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we want to worship the Lord with our giving today. Let me see. Let me see something here. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'd like some special prayers uh, that if we would come together and remember, and I'm really trying to knock this cataract out of my left yes, eye. Yes. I would appreciate it when two or more are gathered and yes. that this thing be pounded, it dissolve in Jesus' name. I went yes. to Iowa City and I'm asking for you guys to help me prayer to say, it is gone, it is removed, it has no right to me, dissolve in Jesus' name and in my daughter's eyes as well. Yep, Father, we set ourselves in agreement with Tara right now. Father, we speak to that cataract in her eye to be dissolved, to be removed, also for Chris as well. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that that cataract is removed. Lord, that she receives her sight. Now, now Lord, you are the creator of the eyes. Lord, we know in your earthly ministry, you opened the eyes of the blind. And Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we believe you, Father, for to open those eyes, to dissolve that cataract, to begin that, that work of, of, of restoration in her eyes. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Thank well, you. you bet. And uh, we set ourselves in agreement. Yes. Alan isn't here this morning. You want to pray for him? I don't know what he needs prayer for. What's he need prayer for? Everything. And overall. Head to toe. And never on overall. Just needs an overall. Yes. All right. Yes. Head to toe. All right. Well, Father, we thank you for Alan. We thank you, Lord, for working in his life. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for making right whatever's wrong. And Lord, just causing strength to be in his body in the name of Jesus. And Lord, just hold him and, and, and Lord, just reveal your power to him in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, this is uh, the first Sunday. Now, you'll have to excuse me because I had to look at my calendar. A lot of things um, lately have uh, meshed together for me, but I'm getting, getting that taken care of. But uh, anyway, this is the first Sunday, and it is Pastor's Love offering anything that is not, uh, well, designated otherwise, I guess, will go uh, for the first Sunday for that. So let's worship the Lord with our giving today. Amen. <laughs> Zechariah 4, 6, 
Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's how the job gets done. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for all the buttons. Yep. <laughs> He's getting stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, now that he's had his feathers plucked, they're going back. <laughs> right. Right. That's about right. Well, praise the Lord. Um, let's take up our Bibles. We always go to the Bible. Amen. Let's take up our Bibles on our hands. I like to wave it around a little bit. Make the devil mad. Jesus glad. I've made the devil mad lately, but I'm going to make you mad a little more. Make you mad, make the, devil, make the devil mad, and Jesus glad, and say, this is the word of God. This, this is, is the, the word of God. God. The word is a lamp unto my feet. The word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. And a light unto my path. I receive the light. I receive the light. I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. Because it is impossible. Because, because it is impossible for God to lie. For God to lie. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Sounds awesome. Yes. Well, praise the Lord. I uh, I have to admit to you, and this is uh, in all transparency, I'm not a numbers guy. I don't mean the book of numbers. I mean mathematics, okay? I'm not a numbers guy. But some are really into math and numbers, but that has never been my strong suit, I have to admit. When it comes to the Bible, though, we find that God places a great deal of emphasis on numbers and number sequences and patterns. Now, there are several examples of this we could give. But, for the sake of this teaching, I'd like to point out the prominence of the number seven. Now, seven and patterns of seven run throughout Scripture. Seven is understood, in fact, to be the number of perfection is therefore often referred to as the number of God. Now, if you would, we're going to be turning in our Bibles today to two openings. We're going to go, first of all, to a book that you probably don't read a lot in. We're going to go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 4. Now, I have to tell you, Leviticus chapter 4, as I would read through the Bible every year, when I would come to Leviticus, it was always hard sledding, I have to admit to you. But I came to understand some things more about Leviticus and the five offerings of Leviticus and the symbolism and all of that, and it's become a lot more of a favorite book to me. But Leviticus chapter 4, and we're going to notice verses 13 through 17 of this opening. Now, I have to tell you, this pattern that you're going to see here is repeated often in the five offerings of Leviticus. But I picked this example of that. Leviticus 4, beginning at 13, reading down to 17, the Bible says, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they, that, and, and they have done some, uh, somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin. This is a sin offering if a sin was done through ignorance. Okay. And bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. Notice verse 17 here. And the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. He shall sprinkle it how many times? Seven, seven times. Amen. Now, 
I want you to notice, secondly, back here in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, just one verse. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9.22. Thank you, Lord. Of course, I'm reading from the King James Version. You already know that. Hebrews 9.22, the writer of Hebrews says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, I want you to notice the word remission in this verse because it translates the Greek word aphasis. Aphasis. And we can understand this word as forgiveness because it's translated six times as such in the KJV or King James Version or remission as it is here in eight other times in the King James. It is also translated as deliverance one time, and liberty, one time. Now, it's in that sense, deliverance and liberty, that I want to consider it today. Now, I've titled this message today, this teaching, Our Sevenfold Deliverance. Our Sevenfold Deliverance. As we study the last hours of the earthly life of Jesus, we find that he shed his precious blood a total of seven times. I don't know if you knew that, but this is something that uh, I uncovered here a while back. It's fascinating. But he shed his precious blood a total of seven times in the last, few, last hours of his life, beginning in the Garden of Gethsemane and culminating with the blood and water that flowed from his side after he had died on the cross. The first Adam placed mankind into bondage, spirit, soul, and body. The last Adam purchased freedom by the shedding of his precious blood for all who would receive him, spirit, soul, and body. First, let's consider the sweating of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm not going to have you go to all these references because it would take too much time, but I'm going to refer to some references where we see these things. First of all, Luke chapter 22, verses 40 through 44. And the Bible says, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, the place being the garden, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This was of everything that he had faced. And you think about this. I'm talking about greater than his temptation in the wilderness. I'm talking about greater than any pressure that he had ever faced in all of his earthly ministry all came together as he stepped into that garden that night and the, the, the realization of the weight of the sin of the world coming upon him, settled upon him in that garden. In that garden, I submit to you that Jesus faced temptation greater than the temptation to turn rocks into bread to feed his hunger. Greater than to prove God's delivering power by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple with the promise that angels would catch him. I'm talking about greater than the temptation to bow down just one time to Satan 
and all of the kingdoms of the world given to him. Greater than those temptations was this temptation to take the easy road, to avoid the cross, to, to not die for the sins of mankind, to not endure the great suffering that he knew that he would. That temptation settled upon him that night, and he faced the greatest spiritual warfare he had ever faced. I find it interesting that Luke, being a physician, is the only gospel writer who includes this detail. This bloody sweat, by the way, is a known medical condition that can occur in times of great stress and agony. Doctors don't know exactly what triggers hematidrosis, in part because it's so rare, it happens so infrequently, but it can happen. They think, interestingly enough, it could be related to your body's fight or flight response, interestingly enough. Tiny blood vessels in the skin break open. The blood inside them may get squeezed out through sweat glands, or there might be unusual little pockets within the structure of your skin. These could collect the blood and let it leak into your follicles where the head grows or on the skin surface as it did with Jesus. And the Bible says his sweat became, as it were, drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, when Adam sold mankind into bondage to sin. We were just that, in bondage to sin. We were in bondage to darkness. Mankind did, no, mankind did not have the ability any longer to say no to sin, to say no to temptation. But as Jesus sweat in that garden, in the sweating of blood in the garden, Jesus liberated us, Jesus delivered us from the inability to say no to sin and temptation. Wow. Now, I, 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 want, I want to say to you that yes, oftentimes we do say no, or say yes to temptation, but it's not because we have to. It's because we choose to. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but it's because it's because we choose to we don't sin because we have to you know the late Flip Wilson used to say the devil made me do it when he was Geraldine that dates me right there praise the Lord but that's okay but he'd say, he'd say the devil made me do it but I want to tell you if you're a child of God the devil can't make you do anything Right? he can't make you do anything now, he can put the opportunity to do it. He can give you the temptation to do it. But because of Jesus sweating that blood in the garden and the fact that you now have the blessed Holy Spirit living in you, you can now say no to temptation just like Jesus did in the garden. Amen. Amen. A story is told one time about a man who had gone on a diet. And he had sworn off all sweets. You have to do that. Amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day he walks into work and he has a box of donuts. <laughs> he has a box of donuts. And somebody says, I thought you swore off sweets. He said, well, I did. He said, but I'm driving by the bakery today. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if you want me to buy a box of donuts, may there be a parking space directly in front of the bakery. And he says, if you know about the third time around the block, there was. <laughs> now that's not saying no to temptation. That's putting yourself in a position to say yes. Uh, but I'm telling you, because if Jesus shed blood, we have the ability to say no to temptation. All right, let's move on because we've got a lot of ground to cover. The stripes on Jesus' back at the whipping post, secondly. John 19, 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now, 
The language of that verse would make it sound like Pilate himself scourged Jesus. We know that he didn't do that. What he actually did was order Jesus to be scourged. And I got to tell you, he had hoped that scourging Jesus, because it was such an awful process, he had hoped that scourging Jesus would win some sympathy for Jesus from the frenzied masses and they may let him go. Of course, it didn't work. I looked in uh, the MacArthur commentary on this verse and MacArthur says this, quoting, Scourging was a horribly cruel act in which the victim was stripped, tied to a post, and beaten by several torturers, i.e. soldiers who alternated when exhausted. For victims who were not Roman citizens, the preferred instrument was a short wooden handle to which several leather thongs were attached. Each leather thong had pieces of bone or metal on the end. The beatings were so savage that sometimes victims died. The body could be torn or lacerated to such an extent that muscles, veins, and or bones were exposed. Such flogging often preceded execution to weaken and dehumanize the victim. Apparently, however, Pilate intended this to create sympathy for Jesus, unquote. You see, at the whipping post, Jesus was beaten, he was bruised, and his precious blood was shed, and I want you to know, despite what many theologians say, I get so frustrated with this. They say, well, you know, everything Jesus did was just for sin. You know, I, I mean, everything he went through was just about sin. But I got to tell you, what he went through, now there were other times where he had such great physical sufferings, but at this whipping post, he was beaten beyond human recognition. In fact, Isaiah the prophet says that his visage was so marred, and this is a, a literal translation, really, of what Isaiah said. He says his visage, visage, his appearance, in other words, was so marred that he didn't appear human. He was beaten so savagely. And we need to get it settled right here. Here and right now, I don't think anybody here has any problem with this, but we just need to get it settled. If someone's joining us by live stream, maybe you bought the religious notion that everything Jesus did was for our sin, but I got to tell you, we need to settle it right now. His body was broken, his, his back was bloody, his skin was bruised so that our body could be whole. Amen. The Bible says he was wounded. For our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. Or the chastisement. Or the punishment that brought us shalom. Was laid upon him. And with his stripes. We were. Or we are healed. Yep. Now 1 Peter 2.4. He said it this way. Or 2.24 pardon me. He says. Who in his own body. On the tree, he, who in his own body bore our sins, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. We, we were healed. Pardon me, looking back, we were healed. Praise the Lord. See, he suffered on at that whipping post and took the beating that he did, shed his blood, and in doing that, he delivered us. From sickness and disease. Because his body was broken. I want to announce to you. Yours can be whole. Amen. Thirdly. Quickly. Oh Kevin hurry. I will. He suffered bruising. And internal bleeding. Isaiah 53 5. You know it says. He was wounded for our transgressions. We just quoted this. Bruised. Bruised. For our iniquities. Bruised is in the singular number. In Hebrew. And we know that the nature of a bruise is when an area of the skin is hit or injured. 
and small blood vessels are broken. The damaged small blood vessels leak under the skin, causing a tender reddish purple area. This is a bruise. Now, Isaiah prophesied that he was bruised for, or literally on account of, our iniquities. He was bruised on account of our iniquities. Now, it says he was wounded for our transgressions, but he was bruised for our iniquities. Now, I want you to know there is a difference between transgressions and iniquities. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been listed that way, but you have to understand transgressions is the act of sin. It is the rebellion. It is to revolt. But iniquities deals with the why of sin. Or what is in us. See, aren't you glad that Jesus delivered us from the practice of sin, but also from the propensity to sin? Hallelujah. You see, by suffering, bruising, and internal bleeding, Jesus won back our right standing with God and delivered us from our iniquities. Thank you, Lord. Well, he also bled, fourthly, when receiving the crown of thorns. John 19, 2, And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. I want you to notice that it's significant that this was a crown of thorns. Now, they, they thought they were just mocking Jesus. They thought they were just making fun of him, but it was directed by the sovereign hand of God. It's significant that this was a crown of thorns. Why? Because we know from Genesis 3.18 that, so that thorns were the sign of the earth's curse. When, when, the, when the curse was handed out, the Lord told Adam, he says, you will earn bread by the sweat of your brow and thorns and thistles will the ground produce. Thorns were a sign of the earth's curse. And Jesus bore that, 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 that curse. It is also significant that this was placed on his head. I want to suggest to you this crown was not gently placed on Jesus' head. No. You know, I got a I got a news alert yesterday, and this news alert said, Did you get up in time to see the coronation of King Charles the Third? And my response was, No. No, I did not. And that's all I'll say about that. However, I did see a news report on it, and here was Charles III, and here was his wife, Camilla, and they took this huge, ornate crown, and they placed it on his head ever so gently, and they placed the crown on her head ever so gently, but I want you to know this crown of thorns was not placed on Jesus' head that way. It was not gently placed on his head. In fact, I want to suggest to you that it was not gently placed on his head, but the thorns were forcefully pushed into his head, and they drove down into his scalp and into his forehead, causing blood to flow down his face. Ancient sources, in fact, that I looked at, tells us this crown was most likely made from the date palm having thorns, check this out, up to 12 inches long. Up to 12 inches long. This would have dug down deep into the scalp and forehead of Jesus, causing severe pain and bleeding. And you know as well as I do, I think, there's nothing quite that bleeds like a wound to the head. Huh? And not only that, the thorns of the date palm had poison in them. It would have caused his head to swell. Now watch this. When Jesus received that crown of thorns on his head, and that precious blood flowed, Jesus delivered us from tormenting thoughts. 
See, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. But watch this. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. This is where the sacrifice of Jesus dealt with our soul. And our soul is comprised of the mind, the will, the emotions, and the intellect. And when, when Jesus' blood was shed from his head and that crown of thorns went on his head, he delivered us from tormenting thoughts. You don't have to be a victim of tormenting thoughts. Jesus delivered you from them. And I want to announce that to you today. Amen. 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 Now, check this out. Jesus pierced hands. Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. The psalmist prophesied, they pierced my hands and my feet in Psalm twenty two sixteen. 16. See, in the fall, the work of man's hands was cursed. And met with sweat and toil. When Jesus' hands were pierced and his precious blood was shed from his hands, the works of our hands can now be blessed and all we touch can prosper because of what Jesus did. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. That's good news. That's good news. Oh, but I want to tell you, the blood that was shed through his feet his pierced feet. We found out from the psalmist that both Jesus' hands and feet were pierced. Now, if you, you've seen paintings, you've seen movies, and every time, I think, all, I, I think every movie or every painting I've ever seen shows the feet of Jesus kind of being put together and crossed and a spike being driven through those feet into the cross. But interestingly enough, it has come to light in more recent years through archaeological discoveries. See, for years they had no evidence of crucifixion ever happening, believe it or not. But in recent years, some archaeological discoveries have been made, and what they found more times than not is that crucifixion was actually done not by putting the feet together and driving a spike through those two feet, but actually taking a spike and driving it sideways through the heel of the condemned. Well, isn't it interesting that in the first prophecy of the Bible, it was said that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. My, my, my. Wow. I'm telling you something. Everything that Jesus did and everything that happened to him was purposeful. It was not by happenstance. It was fulfilling the word. Check this out. Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I'm so glad that man was giving, given authority, among other things, over creeps. Amen. <clears throat> oh, and boy. peeps. Yep. Yeah, amen. Well, anyway, <laughs> but in biblical imagery, placing your feet on something represents dominion and authority. It, it represents you've taken possession of it. Well, you see, Adam lost man's dominion. But when Jesus' feet were pierced and his precious blood shed, he won back our dominion and authority. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. We have our dominion back. We have our authority back. Amen. We don't have to lay down under what the devil's doing or what he plans to do. We have authority in Jesus' name. Hey, guess what? The Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We have authority in that name. But lastly, 
the blood that was shed through the spear in Jesus' side. You, you don't have to think about this, but this is interesting. John 19, 34 says, But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now, Jesus was already dead at this point. At this point, he, they, they, they came to break the legs of the people on the cross to hasten their death. But when they got to Jesus, they discovered he was already dead and his legs weren't broken. Because guess what? The Bible says the Passover lamb, not a bone of him was to be broken. Not a bone of Jesus was broken. And so, to make sure he was dead, the, the Roman soldier stuck his spear into the side of Jesus after he's, he was dead. And the Bible says here, forthwith came there out blood and water. Now, this is interesting because medical experts tell us that the flow of blood and water indicates that Jesus died, check this out, literally, of a ruptured or broken heart. Yeah. Wow. wow. Now, there's some symbolism here. Many, it may, this blood and water may have spoken of the sprinkling with blood and cleansing with water in the first covenant. But I want you to know something, and you do know this, I believe, that blood and water are the symbols of birth. I don't know if you ever witnessed birth or not, but I can tell you that when a baby is born into the world, blood and water flow. Yep. Blood and water flow. Blood and water are the symbols of birth. Well, isn't it interesting that the first Adam birthed his bride from his side? The Bible says that God took a rib from Adam and closed up the, the flesh thereof, and from him, literally, it says, built he a woman. I always said that we know that Eve was built. Because <laughs> the Bible she... says, built he a woman. Oh, well. <clears throat> anyway. But, but praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, but, but I want you to know that just as a bride was birthed from the side of Adam, I submit to you, so a bride was birthed from the side of the last Adam as blood and water flow. The symbols of birth. Oh, wow. Hallelujah. Well, when Jesus' precious blood flowed from his side, Jesus won back our joy, hallelujah, and oh, delivered us oh, from a broken heart. If you've ever had a broken heart or have a broken heart now, I want you to know that the price that Jesus paid in that blood and water that flowed from his side from a broken heart delivers you, liberates you from a broken heart. I want to announce that to everyone joining us by live stream, all of us here in the house today. I want to announce to you that Jesus delivered you from a broken heart. Well... Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, deliverance, or liberty. In the last hours of Jesus' earthly life, his precious blood was shed seven different times. Every time it was, it purchased our freedom in a specific area that it covered. Whoo, hallelujah. Let us pray today. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for revelation, knowledge, and insight. We thank you, Lord, that you um, directed us by your spirit today, that you gave us insight in the word. Now, again, as always, I didn't do it perfectly. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take this word, even in our faulting efforts, and you would cause understanding to come to your people. Give us eyes to see, give us hearts to receive, give us minds to grasp what your word says. And Lord, I pray your richest and best blessings upon all of your people in this place today. We give you thanks for each one, each family represented. We pray that you would bless and prosper each and every one, meet every need from every person, every family, 
in this place today. Those joining us by way of live stream, work in their lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Those who will pick this up later, Lord, may this word be a blessing in their lives. Father, we just commit your people to you in the word of your grace, which is able to build them and give them inheritance. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we just say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, I want to encourage you to greet one another today. Let your brothers and sisters, your family know that you're glad they're here today. We greet you by joining us by way of live stream. Glad you're there. Glad you're there with us if you join us later. But we just bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you very much and have a blessed day today. In Jesus' name. Hey, Kevin.